of God, saw that the daughters of man were beautiful, and they married them, uh, any of them, and they choose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. That means they were not from the earth. Okay? And also afterwards. And the sons of God went to the daughter of man and had children with them. They were the heroes of old, men of the renown. So, this describes the sons of God that came to the earth, so they were not from the earth, and had children with the women of the earth. I started to realize, wait a minute, was this planetary system seeded? You know, it started to, you know, in anthropology, we're missing a huge link between the uh, ancient Neanderthal and so on, and the modern modus, uh, Homo sapiens. And that link is, that link we're missing is getting wider and wider, more and more re records we get. There's new skulls that have been discovered now that makes that link even harder to make. So, I started to think about it and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And so I continued to, to read and then I got across something really that perked my ears. It was in crossing of the of the sea. Exodus um, that's uh, thirteen twenty two. By day the Lord went ahead of them. This is Moses going towards the Red Sea as he's escaping uh, Egypt with all of the tribes of Israel. Moses was son of Pharaoh for 40 years before he realized he was Jew and decided to take the tribes of Israel out of Egypt. Another 40 years in the middle. Yeah. 40 years of Prince, 40 years in the desert, then at 80 he decided. Yeah. But uh, when he decided he was going to go and with the tribes of Israel, he was leaving and all of a sudden the Pharaoh changed his mind and went after him. Well, you know, I was reading this. Now, when the Pharaoh weren't going to let him go, there was this whole thing where Moses and the other high priest of Egypt were having like a battle of manifestation. The ones that could manifest the wildest, craziest things was going to win. So like they had like frogs raining from the sky. He threw his staff down and it turned into a snake. He got water. He got blood to flow through the city and all this stuff. But he won that contest. As I looked at the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, the, the Ark that they call the Ark of God, they give dimensions of that box. It's like a box-like object that's got gold on the outside, wood in the middle, and gold on the inside. Well, that's a capacitor. A capacitor is an object that holds energy. When you charge it, just like a battery, it holds energy. Except that a battery can only discharge the energy very slowly. A capacitor can discharge the energy in an instant. So, he, you know, when I looked at it, I thought, well, that's a neat capacitor. It would be quite large in capacitance. It would be a very high level, a lot of capacitance. It would have really high voltage and and it would be quite heavy it would be a heavy object extremely heavy in fact it would be way too heavy to lift up with two flimsy poles it would weigh over three tons because of all the gold on it and so um, there was problems with that but 
I noticed that the dimensions that were given in the Bible for that box match the dimensions of a box that was found in the remains of uh, King Thoth, King Thoth uh, in Egypt. And then I noticed that those boxes were the exact appropriate boxes to fit inside the sarcophagus inside the Grand Pyramid of Giza. Meaning that the box size is a perfect fit so that you can lower the ark inside the sarcophagus inside the Grand Pyramid and then push the poles in without having to touch the capacitor which would zap the crap out of you. So when you look at and 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 then I notice as well that the outside dimensions of the sarcophagus are exactly half uh, um, actually are twice the volume of the inside dimension exactly okay so it's a perfect octave and then if you measure the arc as described in the Bible that's again twice smaller than the inside dimension of the sarcophagus so now you have another octave and then if you measure the inside volume of the ark as described in the Bible you got another octave it's against twice as big twice as small so it was a perfect fit and I started to think what would you want to carry in a capacitor like that they must have been some extremely powerful energy source any the energy device inside that capacitor but the thing is is that Moses supposedly didn't build that capacitor didn't build that device until he was on the other side of Mount Sinai on the other side of the Red Sea at Mount Sinai when you read the Bible you find that actually the Ark of the Covenant is always portrayed as a very uh, as this box like object with its two poles with some kind of extremely luminous object between the cherubim on top of it and then you see that um, in the Bible the, this object is always described with a huge what they call pillar of cloud or pillar of light above it a huge vortex I had just finished elaborating the mathematics and the uh, topology of the space-time manifold generating huge vortex at the north and south pole of those black holes and if you were to build a small one you would generate a vortex like that as well so I thought that was interesting but I didn't really have anything on it and then I, re I, I read something that boggled my mind this is the crossing of the Red Sea Moses is now going towards the Red Sea and the Pharaoh has changed his mind and is going after him maybe the Pharaoh changed his mind and went after him because Moses left with something the Pharaoh didn't expect Moses was gonna leave with and here it says on the way to the Red Sea by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and at night in a pillar of fire to guide to give them light so that they could travel by day or night neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people but you see that pillar of fire and that pillar of cloud is always described in 
and on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Yet, here, they're not supposed to have the Ark of the Covenant yet. You see what I mean? So now I'm going, wait a minute. The box-like object that, there's this, that they're describing in the Bible might just be the carrying case for the power supply, which is something completely different that generates the vortices and the singularity at the center. So I was starting to read this and I'm like, okay, well, this is interesting and I'm reading more and it's saying that the, this, this uh, clouds above and this clouds below and so on. And I thought, what do they mean What do they mean by God? Right? Because they're calling it the Ark of the Covenant of God. So I did some research on that. <laughs> Where is the word God coming from? What is this thing they call God? It's some kind of object. Okay? But what is this thing they're calling God? So I looked it up. And I looked everywhere and I couldn't find it. And finally, I found it in the preface of my Bible. Look in the preface of your Bible and it will say where the word God was translated from. The word God was translated from the word tetra -gra -ma Tom. Tetragrammaton. <laughs> oh my God. That freaked me out. <laughs> I, it, oh my tetragrammaton, yes. <laughs> that freaked me out. <laughs> Every time you read the word God in the Bible, you can translate it to tetragrammaton. And so I was looking at the root epimiology of the word tetragrammaton. It's like, oh my God, how can I find a word so close to tetrahedron in the Bible? And I, I looked at the epimiology, and it turns out that tetra, which is four, right, was used, four, and grammaton has a root word that can be grammar so four grammar or four letters are taught to be Yahweh the four letter, letters of God you yeah you however when you dig a little deeper in the epidemiology of the word grammaton it ha has actually a deeper root and that root is Four tetra, you know, tetra, which is tetrahedron. Grammaton uh, comes from the word gram or gravity. Weight, you know, it, it's, it refers to weight, gram, and the effect, the effect of gravity. And that's where the word gravity came from, grammaton. <laughs> so now you have a word for God okay that has the structure of a tetrahedron generating a gravitational effect <laughs> and I thought well you know that I'm pushing it right I'm sure you know I mean this is kind of wild but hey, then I look up what the heck is the tetragrammaton in Kabbalistic tradition. And I found that it is an isotropic vector metric in 2D. Here is typically in uh, Kabbalistic tradition the way God is represented. It's represented as uh, isotropic vector metric. Remember, 
four faces 